so good to have you here at Utah Valley University this evening. I'm Susan Madsen. I'm a professor of organizational leadership in the Woodbury School of Business um, here at Utah Valley University and also the founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project. And we do quarterly, well, four times a year, uh, these e evening community events and just delighted with uh, our speakers that we have here tonight. So thanks for coming. A few things before we get started with the speakers. Um, our mission at the Utah Women and Leadership Project is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women through informing, engaging, and developing their voices and confidence, influence, and leadership. And we do this through research is our biggest thing. We, have, we do most of the gender research in the state of Utah. And then also through developing resources. So we have podcasts and infographics and all kinds of things. And then um, events and speaking out in the community. So I, I always put a note up here to th remember to thank our volunteers here tonight, all of you for coming, but also uh, the staff that we have for the Utah Women in Leadership Project. And if you are staff for the project, we have Robin, stand up quickly. Where's Heather? And is, if Kimberly is in the room, she's probably not. Kimberly's probably not. Is Megan or Liziate here? Was Heather here? Did Heather? Oh, there she is. Okay, thank them as well. And again, thank you for coming. I want to also give a special thanks to our three premier sponsors for our four events this year. And they really cover our costs of our cameras. There will be at least 100 or maybe a couple hundred live streaming tonight, and we'll have videos of these presentations as well. MX, Squire, and also L3 Harris are our premier sponsors this year. They do the cameras, like I said, but also some cookies and fruit and vegetables after the event, so you can hang around just a little bit more and dialogue, uh, talk about what you've learned. We also have two supporting sponsors, my own school, the Woodbury School of Business, and also the Utah um, Education Network. And they have been a really good sponsor for many years. They help cover the costs as well of the cameras, but also do the editing. And this program will be on their channel. Which channel is it? Nine? Nine? Thank you. <laughs> Probably a couple times. People tell me sometimes, we see you on TV. I'm like, I don't know what which one that is, but they, they rotate it around, which we love um, our partnership with UEN. Um, we do have lots of social media going all the time, so if you haven't followed or liked or is there any other word that I'm supposed to use? You can tell I'm slightly older than some of you. Um, Please join us on that. We do so many announcements and give you resources out on those social media platforms. And then we have one more event this year, not an evening community event, but one of our four afternoon forums. And uh, this next one is on the gender wage gap, really digging deeper into understanding the complexity of that. And we've had many people ask us to live stream that, so we will have some cameras and some live streaming for that, we have, um, you can see the three people. We have Katie is an attorney who's fabulous with this topic, and Carrie Maine has been the former chief ec um, economist and director of workforce research and analysis at the Utah Department of Workforce Services. And then Erin Jemison is on top of this issue. She's the po uh, public policy director at the YWCA Utah. So if you're interested in that, we have RSVPs online. And so without uh, further ado, I uh, would like to introduce to you first Elaine Dalton. Um, and many of you know her name. She is actually, um, if you didn't know, many, some of you may not, um, you were just remembering that 2013 you were released from being um, um, the general young women's president for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and Elaine and I have been friends for a number of years, and I love that she is still, she's been on the board of trustees for Utah Valley University for a number of years, and last year, I think you've moved off, right? But last, uh, you're still on the board, but not the chair. Not the chair. So last year, or the last few years, she's been the chair of the board of trustees, and that's an important role to make and, and decide and discuss issues for the future directions of Utah Valley University. So I've asked Elaine to first introduce Valerie, um, and then Valerie will speak, and then she'll introduce Sharon Eubank. Thank you.
Well, it's a privilege to be here with all of you magnificent women and you wonderful men that are here too that care enough to come. Thank you so much for your attendance. I am so honored to be able to announce or to uh, introduce these two spectacular women who are doing so much. And there are things on their bio that you'll become aware of, but there are so many other things that they are doing. So first, I'd like to introduce Valerie Hudson. She's a university distinguished professor and holds the George H.W. Bush Chair in the Department of International Affairs at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. And there she directs the program on women, peace, and security. And previously, she has taught at Brigham Young University, Northwestern University, and Rutgers. Ms. Hudson is named the Foreign Policy Magazine's top distinguished scholar of foreign policy, uh, and, or, or, or the, one, the best global thinker of 2009, and in 2015, she was recognized as the distinguished scholar of foreign policy analysis by the International Studies Association, of which she has been a vice president. Uh, so you can see that she has also received the National Service Foundation Research Grant and the Minerva Initiative Grant from the, U from the U.S. Department of Defense. And she is one of the principal investigators of the Women's Stats Pro Project and has advised the National Intelligence Council. She has also, in her spare time, co-authored <laughs> several books that include Bear Branches, The Security Implication of Asia's Surplus Male Population, Sex and the World Peace, The Hillary Doctrine, and the newly published book, The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Hudson has also, is also a former editorial board member of the, the online LDS journal Square Two, the president of the Utah Valley Institute of Cystic Fibrosis, and has been a Lalici leader for 33 years. And besides all of this, and probably her most, her most worthy accomplishment, she is married to David Kassler and is the mother of eight children. So Valerie. I'm so excited to be here. When Susan first said, how would you like to come and talk at one of my events? And oh, and Sharon Eubank will talk too. I was like, I, you know, if I died and gone to heaven, I just thought, wow, this is going to be my two, two of my favorite ladies. And uh, so I'm really thrilled to be here and really thrilled to be the warm up act for Sister Sharon Eubank, right? <laughs> so she is awesome. Uh, so, um, I want to thank Susan, I want to thank the Utah Women's Leadership Program and all of your wonderful sponsors for, for this. And I know we're a little over time, so I'm going to take a little of it. Okay, very good. All right, so I'm here today as the academic part of, uh, of this kind of duet that we're speaking tonight. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the global situation of women and how it affects nations, okay? I think that uh, as... Uh, we became more cognizant of the importance of human rights. Women's rights were, were there. Uh, but the idea that whether you gave women's rights or not would actually help determine whether your nation was secure or not, I don't think that that was really something that most people were thinking about. Uh, and so uh, with uh, some new developments, such as the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. We've been moving into an age where people are beginning to suspect that women are important to assuring the future of the nation. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit in an academic way about that, and then I'll turn it over to, um, to Sharon, who I think is going to ground us in uh, what's actually happening and what can be done as well. All right. so. 
Okay, I'm going to brag that, um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> is that this book is actually going to be released on International Women's Day. And it is, it is uh, kind of uh, our magnum opus. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. This book was a decade in the making, to be honest with you. And it, it shows. You can use it as a doorstop. It's 602 pages. <laughs> but it represents the culmination of everything that I've done as an academic for the last quarter century. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of this book, which is named The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. Uh, and I was really happy to do it with Professor Donnelly Bowen uh, and uh, Professor Lynn Nielsen from BYU. And so it was a really nice collaborative event. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share the highlights with you. Okay. So I'm going to say something that feminist scholars have said for a long time. But I'm going to put some teeth into it. What I'm going to suggest to you is that the very first political order in any society is the sexual political order established between men and women. In fact, oftentimes when I teach my class, I tell my students, let's present, pretend that we're in a video game design class. And you get to create a game for me. And I'm only going to give you a couple of parameters. All right? Your game has to have two sets of uh, players, roughly half and half, and unless they both cooperate, it's game over. And they say to me, well, that's not enough. I need to know more. And the questions they ask me, what they want to know more, are all questions that are political, deeply political in nature. Consider, OK, will those two groups stand before each other as equals? or as superior and inferior? Will decisions for the group be made by one of those two groups or by both of those two groups? If those two groups disagree, will conflicts be resolved peacefully or by force and domination? And lastly, any of you who have taken political science classes, uh, the piece de resistance is always how are resources distributed? You know, whatever is of value, whether it be land or children or wealth, are those distributed equally among those two groups? Or does one group have a preponderance of those resources? Okay. What we would like to suggest is that you could consider a continuum on each of those four dimensions. And you could place human societies somewhere along that. Maybe some societies have more of an emphasis on equality between men and women. Others have a very hierarchical conception. Okay? So as a social scientist, I can say, well, where along that continuum right, um, do particular societies fall? And we will say that the character of that first order is going to deeply mold the resulting society and its institutions and its processes, political processes as well. So the first step we had to take in order to put some empirical teeth to this proposition that maybe women matter was to say, so where are we, where are we going to look to see whether women are empowered? And of course, the big three immediately came to mind. Female literacy, female labor force participation, and female representation in parliament. And then we thought to ourselves, you know, that's really not where we need to look. Let me tell you a story. Back when I was still at BYU, we actually hosted a contingent of women from uh, Afghanistan uh, who had been elected to the Loya Jirga, which is their parliament. Uh, and several of us were supposed to host them through the day. And I remember sitting in the sky room, and I was supposed to interact with one particular really wonderful woman. And I was going gushing naively, you know. I said, oh, isn't it wonderful? Here you are. You're representing the future of Afghanistan. You've got a university education. You've been a elected a member of the Loya Jirga. The future is really bright for the women of Afghanistan. She said, hold on, Valerie. She said, you don't understand. I could go home today. And if my husband said, I divorce you three times, I'd be divorced. 
and I would not have custody of my children. And I would have nowhere to go and nowhere to live. And she said to me, even if I'm not divorced, I may have virtually no say in when my children are married or to whom they are married. So how empowered am I really, Valerie? And that was a real wake-up call for me. And I began to think, it's not literacy. Because, you know, one of the nations that has the highest literacy for women in the world is Saudi Arabia. It's not labor force participation, and it's not percentage of women in parliament, because I can tell you the nation that tops both of those indicators is Rwanda. All right, so there's something deeper. I want to dig down to that first political order. And so the questions I'm going to ask are inspired by what that Afghan member of parliament told me so long ago. How much say does a woman have about getting married, and how old is she when she is married? How much say does a woman have after she's married in the decisions that are made in her household? What types of property and inheritance do women have? Are there inequities in family law, such as this uh, young woman told me in terms of divorce and child custody? Is marriage patrilocal, where a bride goes and lives with her husband's family? Uh, are bride price or dowry paid for her? Right? Bride price is sort of like Johnny Lingo in the <laughs> and dowry, of course, you know, is paid in the reverse direction, where the father of the bride has to pay the groom to take the burdensome girl off her hand. Uh, is polygyny or cousin marriage prevalent? Does society view domestic violence and femicide as normal, even expected, or maybe even obligatory in certain circumstances? And lastly, is rape treated as a property crime against the husband or father of the girl who's been raped? rather than as a crime against the girl herself. That's where I want to look to see the first political order. I want to see what's going on at that household level. And what uh, my co-authors and I have suggested is that this creates a syndrome. It creates a, a first political order that is like a straitjacket for women. High levels of domestic violence. Males control virtually all the resources. Patrilocal marriage, son preference and devaluation of the lives of women, low age of marriage for girls, inequity in family law, polygyny, bride price, sex ratio alteration. Uh, all of these things are like a vice and represents a straitjacket. Uh, it represents the worst part of the continuum um, in terms of the first political order. And what we want to suggest to you is that there is a price to be paid for structuring male-female relations in this way. This syndrome here is a monster of frightful mien that destroys and undermines nations and children and the future of societies. This syndrome is really a trap. Um, usually, we see this kind of very regressive first political order um, when extended male kin groups, think tribes, think clans, are ascendant as the ultimate power source within a society. Interestingly, it is those very same countries that are racked with instability, violence, terror, corruption, and autocracy. But I would ask you, how could they not be? Because the first political order on which they are based is autocratic, corrupt, violent, terroristic, and unstable. You can't build atop that kind of edifice without reaping the consequences thereof. Furthermore, in addition to those kinds of characteristics, we also believe that repressing and subordinating women will undermine other dimensions of national security, such as health indicators, food security, economic performance, demography, and even environmental preservation. In other words, and remember this, what you do to your women, you do to your nation state. And I would like to name that one of the laws of social science. All right. <laughs> If we, 
If we actually operationalize these indicators, which means if we actually went out and collected data on that entire syndrome, on all those variables in that syndrome, we would map it like this, right? And I, I think this is not a surprise to you to find that there is kind of a belt of countries where women are seriously, egregiously subordinated at the household level. Uh, but there are many nations that are still only climbing out of it. Right? If you look at the, uh, the nations in yellow, such as uh, China, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and others, right? moving, trying to move beyond that syndrome uh, has been a, a real journey for these nations. So what I'd like to do now is give you a couple of examples. How is it possible that how you treat women right, is actually connected with things like instability and terror and so forth? Well, sometimes the links are really immediate and proximate, and you can see them very clearly. One example is bride price. Yeah, the eight cow business, right? So bride prices, uh, in fact, about 75% of the world's population lives in an area where that has either bride price or dowry. So it's actually a very common practice. Bride price, uh, and in fact, I don't know if any of you know, but the the, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has actually come out and said that bride price is not good, not a good thing to be practiced, showing that religious organizations, too, have picked up on the link that I'm about to tell you about. Um, bride price tends to act as a regressive and universal flat tax on the subpopulation of young men. Except at the very elite levels, there's usually a going rate for a bride in these societies. And not unlike real estate prices in Utah County, <laughs> there is an inexorable sort of inflationary bubble type of, of uh, phenomenon that begins to set in, pushing bride price up and up and up and up and up. And sometimes that rise can be really swift and really dramatic. Uh, so for example, in northern Nigeria, over the course of a five-year period, uh, they saw a 500% rise in bride price. All right, so this can happen very suddenly, very inflationary. Now, oftentimes governments try to cap bride price, try to prevent bride price from rising, but uh, it's often very unsuccessful. They're unsuccessful. Surging bride prices also fuel a greater prevalence of polygyny, where men take more than one wife. Because as more and more men are priced out of the market, rich men can take additional wives. So the two things kind of go hand in hand. Now, remembering that these societies are based on a very, very androcentric, male-centric first political order, um, this engenders a deep sense of grievance in the young men who have been priced out of that market. Okay? The only way that they can really, truly become adult men in their society is to marry and to have sons of their own but you've just priced them out of the market. So what happens? Well, not surprisingly, rebel groups and terror groups see this and say, we can solve your problem. Do you need money? Do you need bride price? Do you need a bride? If you join us, right, we will provide those for you. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, I've talked to you about um, northern Nigeria. Well, this is, of course, uh, the um, birthplace of Boko Haram. And I think you've seen in the news, right, with the Chibok girls and others, how girls are kidnapped. Uh, and Boko Haram openly uses bride price inflation as a recruiting strategy. The Western media has reported quite a bit on how wives are abducted. But what they don't tell you, what you have to actually go and read the Nigerian press to discover, is that in order to legitimize the marriage, the bride price has to be paid. So as they're kidnapping a girl, they'll leave a token amount of money on the floor as the bride price. Uh, one young lady to whom this happened said, in this crisis, these men can take a wife at no extra charge. Usually it is very expensive to take a wife, very hard to get married, but not now. Now, this is not a phenomenon that is confined to northern Nigeria. We have case studies in places like South Sudan, Pakistan, Timor-Leste, and other places where we can actually show how rebel and terror groups have strengthened themselves because of bride price issues. 
And don't get me started on places like Iraq. I think you know that ISIS actually promised $15,000 in bride price to any foreign fighter who would come and fight for the caliphate. Okay? That would not be an attractive bargain if the bride, bride price dynamics had not made it so. Now, in addition to those sort of very clear, obvious links, there are more long-term structural links as well, linking what you do to women to what happens to your nation. And a great example of this is the increasing masculinization of the world's population. Um, the most current figures I have from the UNFPA suggest that there's about 101.8 men per 100 women on the planet Earth. Now, that may, you may say, well, it's a little abnormal. No, no, this is huge. <laughs> this is actually really huge. Uh, it, it, the, the predicted overall sex ratio should be 98 men per 100 women because women tend to live longer than men. So what you're seeing going from 98 to 101.8 is that we, we literally have hundreds of millions of missing women. They should be here on the planet with us. And they're not. Well, what happened to them? Well, I think you know, all right, which is sex selective abortion and female infanticide. Also, things such as very high maternal mortality rates, uh, high suicide rates for women in some of these very repressive countries. What is shocking to me, as someone who's looked at this problem since the 90s, is that in 1990, when I first started to look at this problem with Andrea Denbor of the University of Kent, we could only find five nations that had abnormal birth sex ratios, and two of them were Hong Kong and Macau, which sort of belonged to China anyway. In 2015, the 2020 censuses haven't come out yet, so I can't tell you what the number is now, but in 2015, when the interdecadal censuses came out, we were shocked to discover that there are now 19 nations that have very abnormal birth sex ratios favoring males. And they're not just surrounding China and India anymore. We've got Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Notice how they cross religions as well. China, Egypt, Fiji, Georgia, India, Kosovo, Kuwait, Lebanon, Montenegro, the Philippines, South Sudan, Sudan, Taiwan, Macedonia, Vanuatu, and Vietnam. In fact, Vietnam now boasts the most abnormal sex ratio in the world. It has out, uh, surpassed China now in terms of the abnormality of its sex ratio, which is ironic because Vietnam is one of uh, the, the, the top uh, sources for brides for the marriage market in China. Okay? So they're sending brides out at the young adult ages, as well as culling girls from the birth population. It is a double whammy. Vietnam is hemorrhaging women, all right? And that is sort of an unseen uh, story uh, in the Southeast Asian region. It's also true that migration affects sex ratios. The first wave of migration is almost always men, in particular, young men who can stand the journey. And in 2015, when the first great wave came into Europe from war-torn countries such as Syria and other places, um, one of the few countries to open their door and say, come, come, was Sweden. Uh, in addition, Sweden also said, if you're under age 18, we will never deport you for any reason. So as you can imagine, those who were turned away from other countries went to Sweden. And virtually all of these young men claimed to be 16 or 17, even though they were, many of them were not. And that means that in 2016, when Sweden um, calculated its sex ratio, they ended up with a worse sex ratio among 16 and 17 year olds than China had. Sweden had 123 young men for every 100 young women in that age cohort. China only had 117 young men for every 100 young women. Now, what are the ramifications of seriously altered sex ratios in favor of males? Well, the research has shown pretty unequivocally a rise in crime rates and political protest rates. 
Uh, and of course, bride prices have surged. For example, in China, which has a terrible marriage market squeeze and is also a bride price practicing society, you now need 250,000 renminbi to marry, which is 13 years worth of average income. Crimes against women also rise. So lots of trafficking from the surrounding nations and even nations that you would not think of. For example, um, uh, two of my colleagues and I are looking at marriage market migration into China and believe it or not, it taps not just surrounding countries like Myanmar and Vietnam and Laos and North Korea. In fact, the top export from North Korea is actually young women across the border into China, but even Pakistan, okay? Even Pakistan, Pakistani women are sold into China. Um, forced prostitution as well, in addition to sort of a, a chattel market for brides. And mobility restriction for women sets in. Uh, where women do not feel as safe in a highly masculinized society. You can even see this among the states of the United States. Some of you may know that some of our states are actually highly masculinized, such as Alaska and North Dakota, and crimes against women are much higher there as well. Uh, infectious disease spread, STDs, HIV, and perhaps even a talk for another time, an altered calculus of deterrence due to altered perception of the cost of attrition warfare. So, so there are some very deep trends, right, that begin to take place and destabilize your society as a result of preferring sons to daughters. Now, is there any statistical evidence? And that's why we had 602 pages. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am so tired of when I say, you know, women actually do matter to the fate of nations, and people say, come back when you've got some rigorous statistical evidence and not just anecdotes. So I got really tired of that. And in fact, I even created the Woman Stats Project to, uh, you know, get me over that hump. <laughs> And believe it or not, believe it or not, in 2014, the US Department of Defense gave us over a million dollars to see if there was any statistical evidence that what we had been saying was correct. Can you believe that? I'm still in shock. <laughs> I'm still totally in shock. So I won't bore you, except those of you who are into any sort of data collection knows, know that what we undertook was just a gargantuan task. I mean, nobody has data on bride price. Nobody has data on patrilocal marriage. We had to go out and operationalize these variables ourselves. Uh, and so it took us years to do it. But we did it. We did it. And then we took on Professor Lynn Nielsen, a professor of statistics, uh, in order to see all right, whether holding many other alternative explanations constant, using the most rigorous standard of significance we could, 0.001, which means that there is less than one-tenth of one percent that we could have gotten these results by chance. Thank you very much. I'll pay you later. <laughs> because again, I knew somebody would say, Significant at the 0.01 level, that's just par for the course. I wasn't going to let them do that to us. So, 0.001. So we looked at nine different dimensions of national security. We were, of course, very interested in political stability and governance and security and conflict. That's kind of my bailiwick. But we also were interested in economic performance. We were interested in if the society was a rentier society or not. Uh, health and well-being, demographic security, education, social progress. And my co-authors had to talk me into putting environmental protection in there, but I'm really glad we did so. Because they told me, they said, trust me, Valerie, what you do to Mother Earth is really contingent, really depends on what you do to women, because Mother Earth is seen as a woman is seen, and she'll be treated as women are treated. I mm. thought that was very interesting. All right. Don't even bother to read this, <laughs> okay? And in fact, can you imagine how long it took me to type this all up? <laughs> we took 
122 outcome variables. And again, all right, I was listening to the little voice that would say, you cherry picked those outcome variables, didn't you, Valerie? If you had used my variable instead of that variable, you wouldn't have found the same results. So I'm thinking, no way that's going to happen to us either. So we looked at 122 outcome variables, many of which were attempting to measure the same thing, so that we got various measurements of things like autocracy, various measurements of things like economic performance. What did we find? Well, I am so happy to tell you what we did find. I think you can see by my smile what we found. <laughs> All right, 22 measures of political instability and governance in 93.8% of the regression runs we did. Don't ask me to explain that right now, but if you want to talk afterward, I will. Okay, we found that this first political order syndrome was significant at the 0.001 level and either had the first largest or second largest effect size in the model, which meant that it was highly explanatory of those outcome indicators. 35 measures of conflict and instability, 75% of the model runs. 10 measures of terror, and I just did the proofs on this one today. This, this particular research is going out in a terrorism journal, 80% of model runs. 22 measures of economic performance, 62.5% of model runs. Public health, 70.8, right? The first caretakers are always the women, unpaid nurses and caretakers to the elderly and the disabled and the sick, right? So there's no you know, surprise here that how you treat women would affect your measures of public health. Environmental preservation, 85.7%. I'm glad they talked me into it. It is true, all right? You're gonna treat Mother Earth like you treat your women. Demographic security, not surprisingly, 71.4%. Education, 60%. Social progress, 75%. Across all of those 122 variables, 71.3%. The syndrome was not only significant, what was the largest or second largest explanatory variable in the whole thing. So, if you're not into regression results, let me give you some odds, okay? So that syndrome scale is like a stepladder. And what you're seeing here on this slide is what, how the odds change as you move just one rung in the direction of subordinating your women. So it, one rung on the ladder, you've more than doubled your chance of being a fragile state. You've more than tripled your chance of having a government that is autocratic less effective and more corrupt. One and a half times the chance of being unstable and violent. 1.28 times the chance of experiencing terrorism. 1.4 times the chance of a country being poor and in economic decline. One and a half times the chance of having a low GDP per capita. One and a half times the chance of having low environmental quality. Almost twice the chance of having a high fertility rate. Pretty unsurprising. 1.83 times the chance of having a higher incidence of in preventable deaths. And 1.8 times the chance of scoring worse on the global hunger index. Why do we get these results? I think there's three primary reasons. We believe that women's disempowerment right there in their homes, right, contributes to instability, conflict, and insecurity in at least three ways. Number one, that home becomes a boot camp, if you will. There is no better training camp for political violence and instability than lived domestic terror perpetration, lived domestic corruption and exploitation, lived domestic autocracy, okay? When you train your men in these skills, don't be surprised if they use them outside the home as well. And studies have shown that the more gender unequal attitudes a person holds, the more likely they are to commit political violence. We've even seen some stunning research that looks at uh, mass killings in the United States. What's one of the greatest risk factors besides being male <laughs> for being a mass murderer in the United States? Domestic violence perpetration. 
okay, domestic violence perpetration. They've been trained in how functional and effective it is to use violence against others. Second, as we saw with abnormal sex ratios and bride price, <clears throat> subordinating women, suppressing women, oppressing them also creates these chronic structural goads that destabilize your society. Inflationary bride price, prevalent polygyny, sex ratio alteration, right? That's like pulling the asp right to your breast, right? That's embracing, if you will, instability, chronic, unsolvable instability into your society. And lastly, of course, when you disempower women, you mute their voices. The voices of the very people whose influence could profoundly challenge this logic of autocracy and terror and violence. So we think those are the ways, uh, the reasons why we are seeing such strong results. So what does this mean? As a, a person who studies international security, it means to me that Hillary Clinton was right when she said in 2012 on International Women's Day when she was Secretary of State, the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and to the national security of our country. When we think that we have put rigorous analytical teeth behind that statement. It is not just some sort of politically co correct fluff. It's not anecdotal, all right? This is really the truth. The character of male-female relations, I say, is the coal mine. Now, the reason I say it's the coal mine is that oftentimes someone will say, Professor Hudson, you don't understand, all right? Um, what's happening with women, that's just like the canary in the coal mine, all right? The, the real coal mine is that we lack democracy or there's resource scarcity, or there's deep poverty, right? And I say, no, I think you've got that backward, okay? The coal mine is the character of male-female relations in your society. The canaries who are squawking and keeling over dead to try to tell you there's something wrong with your coal mine are poverty, ill health, conflict, terror, economic decline, demographic problems, environmental destruction. Those are the canaries. And the coal mine is your first political order. Thank you. <laughs> I'm loving this audience. Sharon, I'm warming them up really well for you here. <laughs> now, of course, I'm a foreign policy person. That's what I do for a living. So, Permit me to bore you and tell you what I think would change about foreign policy if this was understood. So, for example, I would say, what about situational awareness? If the U.S. is not tracking what's going on with women, especially at the household level, how can it expect uh, to anticipate instability in other countries? If it's not tracking things like bride price, if it's not tracking polygyny, if it's not tracking sex ratios, and these other things that we've talked about, how can it hope to have an effective foreign policy? How will the U.S. decide which subnational actors are most likely to bring stability in the long term? Unless you first look at those subnational actors and decide what each one wants to do with women. Let me give you an example. I believe it or not, several years ago, I got to have lunch with Gloria Steinem. How cool is that? <laughs> and. Um, she told this amazing anecdote, which we put in our book called The Hillary Doctrine. And she said this. She said that she was down in D.C. at the State Department at a State Department briefing uh, shortly after the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. Uh, and one of the speakers, uh, who I think was actually the Secretary of State, came out and he was talking about how we were going to support the Mujahideen, how they were the freedom fighters standing up against the godless commies who had taken over the Afghan government. Uh, and she asked, she asked so why are the, what are they so upset about? 
Well, the Soviets are insisting that all girls be educated. The Soviets are insisting that women have the right to vote. The Soviets are insisting that women can actually stand for political office. And she said, I don't understand. Aren't we backing the wrong side? And she said, my question fell into that awkward hush which is reserved for the ridiculous. <laughs> and she said, if I knew then what I know now about who those Mujahideen were and how they would morph into the Taliban, she said, I would have chained myself to the seat in that auditorium until my question was answered. She's right, right? The, the people that we backed did not bring peace to Afghanistan. They brought horror to Afghanistan. And how could you have predicted it? Because they brought horror to women first. Think about that. How will the US avoid the trap of peace negotiations where the rights of women are bargained away to make peace between warlords? If it doesn't understand, you're not going to get peace through warlords. You're going to get peace through empowering women and you cannot leave them out of the peace negotiations. How will the US track which of its own citizens are the greatest internal threat if domestic violence is not taken as a serious threat? If domestic violence is not viewed as domestic terror? <laughs> immigration. How will the US rationally approach immigration if it doesn't comprehend that the true clash of civilizations is not about religion, it's not about ethnicity, but it's about the subordination of women. I spent six months in Australia in 2017 um, at the Australian National University, and I was shocked to discover that in order to gain citizenship in Australia, you have to answer questions like, is it legal in Australia to do female genital cutting? Is it legal in Australia to beat your spouse? Is it legal in Australia to arrange a marriage for your child without their consent? I didn't understand that this was on their immigration checklist. And a lot of people poo-pooed it and said, well, they know what the answers are supposed to be. They're just going to lie. But that wasn't the point. According to the people that I spoke to uh, in the Australian parliament, it was to make sure that anyone who wanted to live in Australia on a permanent basis knew where Australia stood. And not only would they know where Australia stood, their spouse would know where Australia stood. Their children would know where Australia stood. Okay? That's something to keep in mind. How will the US know that ending child marriage worldwide would do more for world peace than almost any other investment? That's something to consider. Child marriage is just the hub of this immense cascading wheel of negative consequences for society that virtually condemns a nation to a poorer outcome for its children than it would ever have had otherwise. How will the US know when exporting democracy makes sense and when it doesn't? If you've got a first political order of autocracy and terror and you try to veneer democracy over top of that, don't be surprised if you don't get democracy, but some sort of Frankenstein version of democracy that bears no real similarity to what we're really talking about here. I believe that one day the idea that foreign or national security policy could ignore the situation of women will be seen as laughably naive. Okay, that day is not here yet. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who said, I just don't see this link. One of my colleagues right down the hall, I don't see the link. National security, that's when people are shooting at you. What do women have to do with that? Women are never going to shoot at you. <laughs> but I, you know, I think one day, one day, this will come. Now, Professor Madsen has, has encouraged me to think about, you know, how about closer to home? Well, in Utah, I believe that the Utah Women's Leadership Project has noted a stunning deficit of women's voices in the Utah legislature. All right, that's not good. That's not good. Uh, as her statistics have shown, it's the 11th highest state in the nation for forcible rape. How the heck did that happen? 
It has the largest gender pay gap in the nation, looking only at women working full time. Furthermore, and I, I call this shamelessly from what Professor Madsen has done, only 32% of managerial positions are held by women compared to 40% nationwide. On the bright side, 13th best in the country for maternal mortality. I will say to you, perhaps some of you saw my Deseret News op-ed, that the idea that we would decriminalize polygyny, given all that I've spent my life doing, is insanity. But that's for another day, too. <laughs> On the bright side, Utah has outlawed female genital cutting. <laughs> yes. Of course, it was in 2019, but you know, it's OK. Better late than never. Other statistics, you know, closer to your own family. Uh, if you look at all of the homicide victims in Utah in 2019, and if you look only at the women, you'll find that 67% of those victims were killed by an intimate partner, and in one case, by her own son. We have some stunning levels of violence within our homes. Should we talk child support? <laughs> Um, over $212 million in child support payments were collected in just one year in 2016, and that was only a fraction of what was due. 40% of Utah's children now live in low-income families, and a lot of it has to do with lack of child support. And then in 2017, which is the latest that I could find figures for, 10,612 substantiated cases of child abuse, which is higher than the national average. One source says eighth highest in the nation. All right, so there's some work to be done here with our first political order. So to sum up, and I think I'm actually on time. To sum up, if there's one takeaway that I want you to take away from this auditorium tonight, what you do to your women, you do to your family you do to your community, you do to your nation, and you do to your future. Thank you very much for allowing me to be with you tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie Hudson, for just enlightening all of us here. And, and um, thank you for the time and the passion and the expertise that you've used to, to help us understand what's happening. I think she's right. Now it's my privilege to introduce Sharon Eubank. She's a dear person to me. I've, I've loved her since I first met her. She's changing the world. She is the president of the Latter-day Saint Charities, and she's also the first president in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Relief Society. She uh, started with fed federal government work and small business experience, and then in 2000, or or 1998, she joined the LDS Charities. And as a part of that, she established 17 international employment offices helping women qualify for jobs or to start small businesses. And then for five years, she directed the Humanitarian Wheelchair Donation Program, expanding both the number and the quality of those donations. And in 2008, she became a regional director for the Latter-day Saint Charities for the Middle East. And in, she oversaw humanitarian work in 11 countries in that capacity. And then, 2011, Ms. Eubanks uh, appointed the, was appointed the director of the Latter-day Saint Charities Worldwide Operations, and then she was named president of the Latter-day Saint LDS Charities in 2018. So, in addition, in 2017 is when she was asked to serve in the general presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints 
women's organization, and I might add the largest women, women's organization in the world called the Relief Society. And in this capacity, Sharon Eubanks helps provide leadership and training and resource for 7.1 million women in 162 countries. Sharon Eubanks. First of all, you're wonderful. What kind of a crowd are you? <laughs> Second of all, I'm so thankful to Dr. Madsen for the tremendous, consistent work that she's doing on these topics. I love that UVU is known for this kind of research, this kind of community presence. This, this wasn't a warm-up act, Valerie. This is, like a, this is like a New York Metropolitan Opera aria. <laughs> Nobody can follow the standing ovation and the information you gave. So I'm happy to just be the little dessert snack afterward. <laughs> But what I love about following in the position of this program is we have a chance to think about all of that data, all of that research, this, this thing that's so close to your heart and the way we felt it, we felt what that's like, and now have a chance to talk about, but what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do now that we know this? And how can it work in the situations that we have that are, that are you know, our lives, the way they are? So I like this topic. Because we're talking about becoming global citizens, and I hope that every single one of us walks out of here with something in your heart that you care a lot about that you're going to do. I can't create that, but maybe you can. Maybe there will be something with you that you say, OK, I'm going to do something that I haven't been doing before. If we did that, I don't know how many people are in this room, but a lot, and people that are watching you know, online, if every person did that, the energy just in Utah would shift. Think what that would do if we just chose each one thing. So I have the very interesting position of being in the leadership of two global organizations. As, as Sister Dalton said, the, the Relief Society, we now have 7.5 million members in, in 162 countries. And think of the leadership that they provide. In 30 3,000 congregations, there are nine women you know, providing leadership as part of that leadership council. I get to be part of that at the general uh, level, which is, which is really fascinating for me to watch how dynamics work and how we work in family levels, but at this global level too. I also am this president of Latter-day Saint Charities. We work in 189 countries. Every year we do more than 2,000 projects. We work with partnerships from the United Nations all the way down to, you know, midwife associations. Very, very interesting to be part of these. At the same time, both of these organizations have a grassroots component because we're talking about families that work and women that belong to the Relief Society. And what do they do in their own spheres, uh, which is grassroots, and also Latter-day Saint Charities at the congregational level? What do we do about emergencies? And what do we do about the situations that arise out of the communities that we live in? that are poverty and hunger and those kinds of things. So my point is, we ha I, there's a global component and global organizations, and there's also a grassroots component. And finally, I want to talk about the individual component. Where, where's Grace? Did she come? Is she here? All right, she's not here. <laughs> but, but I got introduced to Grace's mom. Where's Grace's mom? You're great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just stand up for just a second? <laughs> Thanks for recognizing that your name is Grace and that you're here. <laughs> Grace just returned from a mission to Singapore and, Malaysia. Singapore and Malaysia. Now, why did you come tonight? I'm the best friend here. My mom's here. Her mom's my little sister. Okay, that's not a throwaway reason. We're here because of the way we're connected, right? We come because we care about the same things. What do you want out of tonight? I think where I was living in Singapore and Malaysia, I felt like I was like giving back a lot. And I guess coming back here, I just kind of learned how I can make a difference locally. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. You can sit. <laughs> everybody in this room. <laughs> everybody in this room is Grace. 
We're looking for that kind of grace in our lives. We want to figure out how can I give back? How can I make a difference? How can my actions matter to me and the people I'm connected with and the place that I live? You're a perfect example. You did really well. The World Bank did a study, and it, it came out in 2014. I can't even compare it to the study that we've just seen. But it talked about if you want to make situations better for the statistics about poverty, violence, all the things that Dr. Hudson talked about, you need to focus on two things. This is World Bank. You need to focus on agency, and you need to focus on voice. Well, I'm extremely interested in this, because I think about agency in a religious context. But here's their definition of agency. It says, uh, the capacity to make decisions about one's own life and act on them to achieve a desired outcome, free of violence, retribution, or fear. So you can see how this feeds into the, some of the things Dr. Hudson talked about. Voice, the capacity to speak up and be heard from homes to houses of parliament. It's the ability to shape and share in discussions and decisions that affect the person themselves. All right, so let's think about tonight Agency and voice, the ability to decide what happens to you and to affect that, and then voice to be able to have your perspective heard and taken into account. So what does it look like when men and women support each other's agency and voice? And I, I reject the, the idea that for, in order for women to progress, men have to lose. Or in order for matriarchy to get its due, patriarchy has to lose. I just, I won't believe that. I'm dedicated to the idea that it is the interdependence of men and women, particularly when it's focused on the rising generation, that is what creates change. Now, you could see some of that that we talked about here. What does that kind of interdependence around agency and voice look like? Of course, this is anecdotal because I'm just going to read anecdotal, but we have a book's worth, 602 pages, <laughs> that will back up the anecdotes. But this is a woman in Ecuador. She's talking about what this looks like in her own life. I have free space to decide for myself, no longer dependent on others. For me, it is a source of pride that my husband asks my advice. Now there isn't machismo, there is mutual respect. Together we decide. In her household in Ecuador, that's what that looks like. This is a man in Vietnam. Happiness and equality are related. If the husband understands that and is supporting and helping his wife, the happiness of the whole family will be reinforced. And this is a man in Niger. The woman helps the man manage the household. It's a partnership. We want it that way. Here in town, a man does better when his wife contributes. So these are three families that have found that intersection between the, the interdependence of men and women and what it looks like for them. And they feel the benefits that are coming back to them and to their family too. So almost every study will say that the interdependence of men and women working together and, and safeguarding everybody's equal access to agency, the ability to decide, and voice, it creates benefits that flow back. Now, the World Bank says those benefits are psychological and economic. We've talked today about the security benefits of that. This is the question of the 21st century. The thing that we're talking about today would have more impact if we can understand it and affect change than any other thing. It affects every person on this planet. So, I thought today, you don't get this kind of cultural behavioral change from World Bank reports, and you don't even get them from academic studies. We don't change our behavior that way. How do we change our behavior? by experiences. Experiences change our minds from the old traditional thing we were doing to the new thing. So in order to make this work, we have to have new experiences. And for me, we all have the chance to participate in some of those. So I thought I would spend today talking about new kinds of experiences that have helped change people's minds, if you'll just allow me. So I have to remember, oh, there's my first slide that I should have shown. <laughs> I want to talk about the ways that global organizations are strong. There are strengths that global, big global organizations have that it's helpful for us to know when we want to, to talk about changing experiences. The first strength that they have is to aggregate tiny efforts 
into a big impact. And the, the example that I'm using is from Latter-day Saint Charities. 1985, there's a cyclical famine in the Horn of Africa, and it's devastating. The BBC did a seven-minute broadcast on this, and in the pre-Instagram times, it went viral. All of the news agencies picked it up and watched it. Well, all kinds of people all over the church and the communities looked at this, and they said, we ha we, surely we can do something. Now, you, you have Queen giving their, you know, their big concert, and you have Live Aid, and you have pe everybody was energized. What can we do? How can this be the 20th century that people would starve at that level and we would not do something about that? So in the tradition of the Latter-day Saint Church, we decided we would fast, going without eating for two meals and then taking that money that somebody else might be able to eat. So I go without eating that somebody else might eat. And in a lot of ways, it's an elegant solution because anybody can participate. Anybody can do that. It takes small little bits of money, and it brings it together. From two fasts in 1985, $10 million was raised. $10 million was a lot of money. <laughs> then the church says, what are we going to do with the $10 million? What can we do that will be effective to actually? So this is a picture of a very young M. Russell Ballard, in his plaid <laughs> shirt. And he was a brand new apostle, and he was sent to Ethiopia to look at who's doing work that matters, who's doing work that makes a difference. And he went with Glenn Pace, and they were responsible for giving that money to agencies that were making a difference. Now, I, I just love that photo of him. <laughs> they did several things. They worked in partnership with the Red Cross, with Africare, with Catholic Relief Services. Catholic Relief are the ones who said, We'll show you how to do this. <laughs> you're new. You're new to this. Let us show you what it looks like to do famine relief. We're very grateful for that partnership. They are Latter-day Saint Charity's oldest partner. And they worked on weighing kids and educating parents and providing a meal that people couldn't eat before regular food. They did big berms and, and dams to hold back water to increase so that when there is another drought, they have more access to water. They did a lot of work. It took eight years to spend that $10 million. But even 20 years later, when we went back to look, those water catchment places are still in operation. So we were happy about that. To aggregate small efforts for a big impact. That's one thing that big global organizations do well. Now, this is the Sustainable Development Goals. This is the United Nations saying, if we cooperate, if we coordinate all of these efforts around these 17 goals, we can make progress. And we'll collect impact, and we'll, we'll, we'll all work together on certain things. And they're driving a vision, an agenda about that. So that's another good thing that global organizations do. Global organizations can go to a national government and they could say, what are your mandates? What are your priorities? What help do you need? And then they augment or help sustain those national governments. And I've just put three of our partners here. This is a, this is a school lunch program in Durban, South Africa. So the, Af the government said, we don't have school lunch and our children lack uh, nutrition. Parents want to contribute. Can you help us set it up? So these were our partners, Catholic Relief, Islamic Relief, and Israel Aid. Nice. Nice little faith group there. This is one of the fathers, and I think they're growing cabbages in the back. But they, they provide school lunch and the gardening for the school lunch for 40 different schools, and the trucking system, and all the parents are out there. It was, it was a fabulous little project. Another strength of global organizations is that they can cross borders for common problems. Because problems don't get, they don't get not neatly contained in national borders or just neighborhoods. They, they sprawl everywhere. So the Relief Society, President Bingham has said, we're going to work as a Relief Society on the four things that stop women from engaging in Relief Society. And they are nutrition, when we're young, literacy and education, preventing abuse, and emotional stability. Those are the things that prevent people from actually moving on and taking those things. So she's, she's using her platform and, and the work in the councils to, to work on some of those things. Another strength of global organizations is in conflict, conflict and disaster relief, we, we can sometimes go places where other people can't go. A great example is the famine in Yemen right now. Yemen is so unstable because of the coup, because of the fighting, everything else. Aid workers get killed there all the time. But we're working with certain partners that have a commitment that they'll stay. Now, when there's a disaster, when there's a relief, and you start seeing video of 
you know, people who've left their house with their chainsaws and they go out to Texas and they spend their vacation chainsawing up hurricane sites and things like that. That gets created not because of individuals. If you send a bunch of individuals with chainsaws into a disaster zone, <laughs> it's going to create some more disaster. <laughs> But when global organizations are able to, to, to provide structure for that, then it's incredibly powerful what is able to be done with that. All right, let's talk about the strengths of grassroots organizations, which are very different. The first one is, and I often remember this story, I was after the Southeast Asian tsunami, in, I was in Sri Lanka, which is that little pear-shaped island off the coast of India. And we were, we were driving from one place to another, and we stopped at the place where the, the country train goes laterally across the country. It's up on tracks. And people heard that the tsunami might be coming. And they took children and handed them up to the people in the train because it was elevated on the track and it would be high. And when the wave hit, it took that train and just tumbled it. And, and 1,700 people died in the train. So this is five months later. And I'm there working on housing and, and helping fishermen get their boats back. And, and we've driven packed where to this, and it's suddenly where the train is, and we get out of the car so that I can see it. And there are families camped all around that train five months later. And there's a big sheet that's tacked to the train that says something in, in the language. And so I asked Shanta, who was my driver and my interpreter, I said, what does that say? And he said, we now respect the power of the sea because we, it took our children from us. So these are families who lost their children in that train, and they're frozen. They, they, don't, they don't know how to go anywhere. And everyone came up to me, you know, touching my hand and saying the English that they knew, I lost my baby. I lost my father. Help me. And I didn't have any ability to do one thing there. I can't explain to them what I'm doing. I can't talk about the housing that we're trying to get funding for or the fishermen's boats. I have nothing to offer them. But Shanta does. He speaks the language, he gets a soccer ball out, he starts playing soccer with the kids, he starts asking the parents what's happening, what's going on. I didn't have any ability to be effective in that situation because I don't understand the culture and I don't speak the language. And this is brutal, but it's true. We're most effective where we live because we understand those things. We have the strength. It's exotic and we get motivated by building schools in Peru. But we are most effective in Utah County because we stay here. We live here. We get the dynamics here. We speak the language. So that is one, one thing. Oh, I just want to say, the, this, is, this is from the Dem Dem uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And the issue was they need more protein in their diet. If I had solved this problem, I would not have brought a duck in a basket. <laughs> But they do, because this is going to work for their situation. So all those sisters, those women, sat around, and they learned what to do with that duck. <laughs> I don't have the ability to teach this class, but they do. <laughs> there's the duck all plucked, roasting on the charcoal, and there's the family eating the duck. <laughs> so they've just learned how to prepare a local solution for a local issue, and everybody learned that skill, and everybody enjoyed that duck. <laughs> Another strength of local grassroots organizations is you've got to find solutions to fit the circumstances. Now, Sister Bingham just came back from the Philippines where they did, uh, by stake, they were doing how many children under five have signs of malnourishment? So they did the protocols, they did the weighing and the measuring and the height. The stake president said, you know what, I don't think we have a problem in our stake. I don't think we have any. Everybody is eating, everybody is full. And that turned out to be true. Everybody is eating, but they're eating instant noodles or white rice. So of 129 kids that were screened in one day, only one child was in the green. 60% of them were in the red, which means that there's stunting going on. So what do you do about that? So everybody was shocked and amazed. The traditional solution from NGOs is we need to provide supplements to the kids. We're going we're gonna to buy supplements in the market and they're going to have to eat those supplements. But that's not a sustainable solution. Family said, we can't afford those supplements. We, and we don't want to be dependent on an NGO to bring in those supplements. So what do they do? They got together as a council in their whole community and they said, well, we're going to grow our own nutritious food. We're going to have parenting classes and nutrition classes. We're going to do cooking things. And so here are these parents of these kids 
making these little seedlings. And as you go out, they've planted those seedlings into these big acres. And every day, parents are assigned to come work on that. And then their mantra is, don't eat white. <laughs> eat green, eat orange, eat yellow, but don't eat white. <laughs> and that's a, that's a definite solution. Would I have come up with that solution? Probably not. Because I'm going to come up with brochures and training and PowerPoints. And that's not going to work in the Philippines. But they found something that works. Another strength of grassroots organizations is that they're nimble to adjust. This woman is named Eva Syed. She's a nurse, and she's in northern Iraq. And her passion is training of nurses. Nurses don't get strong training, especially continuing training. So she's, her passion is to build a facility, to bring people in, to take training to wherever people are. And in the middle of her dream, with the government support that she had from Baghdad and, and Erbil, the war happened. ISIS invaded, and her whole dream is shot because people can't travel. But because the program was based on her, she's there, she's Kurdish, she lives there, she gets the population, she modified the training program to actually take advantage of the situation with the war and to be able to treat people who were uh, f f uh, injured in the war or people who were in the camps. She actually trained the whole, she changed the whole program to be nimble to address the new need. Now. If you work closely with the United Nations, that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> you, don't, you don't turn a giant ship like that to a nimble need. It, it, takes, it takes years and studies and all kinds of things. But grassroots organizations are able to be very nimble and, and move. My favorite thing, this is low bureaucracy and personal relationships. And that's for sure true. The way that Grace feels about the people she's with, that's how we make change. Now, I'm with my friend Kathy. She's in the slide there. You can tell she's having fun. What's going on in that photo? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're eating dinner. This is part of a circle thing, and you're having, at least you're eating, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Low bureaucracy, personal relationships. Now, in order for us to be the leaders of this kind of change, I want to talk about some characteristics, leadership characteristics that actually make a difference if you're trying to implement some of these things. And I'm going to highlight some of the, the organizations that maybe work in our community, but I also want to highlight individuals. Because you've got global organizations, you've got grassroots organizations, but I never want to discount the power of individuals themselves to, to create change at that family level, at the dynamics of what's going on in our own families. I think that changes the world. Now. My friend, who's come, will you just stand by me just for a minute? Come, come up here so everybody can see you. <laughs> this, is, this is Manu Chakos. You're from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yes. How long have you lived in the United States? 30 years. 30 years. Manu had how many children? Four together. Four all together. So you have a stepson and three children of your own. Yes. She was m married when you came, but not married now. No, I'm divorced. Divorced. Had to, s to support those kids. Yeah. How many of your children graduated from high school? All of them. All of them. How many of them graduated to college? And you be you, three of them. Three of them from here. <laughs> where, do, where does your son work? I'm Governor Hatch in Washington, D.C. Okay, he's been working with Governor, I mean, with uh, Senator Hatch. Senator. In, in for two years. Yeah, two years, and he's going to come back to go to another two years. Where did you experience your uh, refugee experience? Where did you come from before you came to the United States? Nairobi, Kenya. Right, and how long were you in Nairobi? Four years. I mean, two, I mean four months. Four months. <coughs> so you can just, a little glimpse of what has happened in Manu's life, and yet what has happened in her experience refuses to define her because You've changed everything for your family. Your four children have a completely different experience yes. because of you. Because I have a dream. Because you have a dream. <laughs> if you spent more time with Manu, you would hear, she knocked on the door, she called up, she said, my skill is to call people up and tell them what I need. She called up Habitat for Humanity and said, look, I need a house. And they said, OK. So her family <laughs> built their house. <laughs> and she, aren't you proud of your house? Yeah, I had my house for 15 years. 15 years. <laughs> 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 
this is a tremendous story of somebody who says, I'm not going to wait and, and wait for somebody to organize something for me. I have the power inside me to ask, to, to work, to grow. Now, Manu is a, is a, she's a graduate of Circles program. Anybody familiar with Circles? Besides Kathy, who's the director? <laughs> <laughs> circles is, is, if you're a circle leader, that means that you are Manu. You're taking charge of the change you want to see in your life. And Circles brings allies around you mentors, other people, friends, who are going to encourage you and support you. Well, Manu's a graduate. You graduated from being a leader, and now you're an ally. So now she's an ally for other people. Just, just tell me, one, you told me right before, just stand up one more time. <laughs> what, what did you do at Wendy's today, or yesterday? Uh, I took one of the sister, she's a refugee, she lived in this country for four years, and she doesn't speak English. So I make a phone call and say, can we talk? We sit down and talk, talk about job, we should talk about her children. And I say, OK, I'm going to go downtown. I went, I sneak up, I went to Windy and talked to one of the boss manager. And I say, I have a sister who doesn't speak English. She's a shame like me. So can you give her a job? And he said, yeah, bring her up. <laughs> so I bring her to Windy. And then the manager interviewed the daughter and the mother fill up all the application form and get a job. Because I do know that woman, she looked like me 30 years ago. Yeah, she exactly, she looked like me. So I have to reach to some of our sister who came to this country, a refugee, who are shy, they don't speak the language. That's what I do. And I'm gonna continue to do. I also have some kids in Africa. I'm helping them to buy a backpack for school, she helped me. <laughs> and I, when I go to Africa and I give to all the children in the, my own town, make sure I, every kids have to go to school and have a shoes in their feet. Look at the power of Manu. <laughs> I just, I didn't want to tell her story. I want you to meet her because of the power of individuals at the individual level. I don't want to ever discount that. And you got somebody a job. You helped somebody get a job. And I just love that. So don't wait to be the change that you seek. If we, people say all the time to me, the church should do this. The government should do this. And I think we are those people. They are us. <laughs> we should. But I don't ever want to wait for somebody else to organize something or plan something. I'll be the one. Like, can we be the ones to do that? The second that we learn that lesson, the power of that lesson, that I don't need to wait for somebody to organize something, everything shifts. And I can see in your faces you already know this. When you decide, I don't need to wait for somebody else to plan this, I have the power of the hope and the energy, things shift. And I'm tremendously energized by that idea. So, amen. amen. <laughs> Let me give a couple of examples. Because we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in Utah, I just had to talk about Martha Hughes Cannon. So in the late 1870s, the health situation in, in the Utah Valley, in the, in the Pioneer Valleys along here, was terrible. And, and diphtheria, we don't get diphtheria anymore, but diphtheria killed 749 people in one year. And one of the reasons it killed people was midwives and nurses would, some were very good at delivering babies and they didn't have any mortality, but others weren't, weren't skilled at hygiene practices and they went from family to family spreading diphtheria. So Martha Hughes Cannon, she decides, we gotta do something about that. The Relief Society was sponsoring the tuition for certain women to go back east and become doctors, and Martha says, I'll do it. So she goes back east. She actually was one of the very few people who did not have to have an interview because her credentials were so uh, impressive. So she, she went to medical school in University of Michigan Medical School, and she didn't even have to have an interview. So she goes. She comes back and she works her whole life in public health. And, she, and the, in, the infant mortality rate went down, the disease rate went down. She trained all kinds of nurses and doctors. These women set up Deseret Hospital. They, they trained midwives. These six 
women doctors who went back in the 1870s and then came back to Utah had a profound effect on the health in these valleys. Well, in 1896, she decides to run for the Utah State Legislature. Among other people, she beat out her husband. <laughs> she was the Democratic nominee. And she won. So what's one of the first things, if you're Dr. Cannon, what are you going to do? She puts forward a bill to create the Public Health Office of Utah. And so she, it, that was very revolutionary in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. So when you normally go around to your business and you see this government entity that says, Utah Department of Health, Cannon Health Building, I just want you to know, why is that name the Cannon Health Building? Yeah, Martha Hughes Cannon. She created that. She created some of that infrastructure. She went on, she was the first female state legislator in the country. And she had all of that impact. Why? Because she didn't wait around for somebody to open the door. She organized that. She made those differences. Now, every person in this room could tell those stories about that. We've heard Manu's, and I think it's a great one. Let me just tell one more. I had the chance to meet Sarah Bateman last year at the, uh, the LDS Earth Stewardship. She won an award there. She lives in Orem, and she looks around in Orem, and she says, this place is going to explode with growth. What do I care about? I care about protecting the reason I moved to Orem. I want bike paths. I want a clean air. I want to protect the watershed. I want to protect parks. So she started several different things. The first one is she founded Orem's Natural Resource Stewardship Committee. And they focus on recycling and water conservation and biking and gardening. And she says, I'm a gentle diplomat. I have a sincere love for the people. My work requires communication and persuasion. Patience and persistence are my ever-present companions. It takes a lot of faith and optimism. But I love that she's doing that. Now, one of the things that she started in 2008 is the Orem Community Free Swap. Anybody been? You take stuff that you don't want anymore, you put them out on tables, and other people come. And in these four pictures, you can see what they wanted. So this guy got a violin. And look how happy he is, or she is. <laughs> Those people got books, but the, it's just a free, and people can't believe that it's free. And low-income people, refugees, they ask several times, it's OK to take this. It's free. And for her, it's part of recycling. We're just, we're just transferring resources. But for 12 years, that's been going on. Just one of the many examples that, that uh, Sarah did. So those are examples. My question to you is, what will you do? What will you do without waiting for somebody else that they should organize something? What will you do? The next thing I want to talk about is nurturing personal, lasting relationships. When I first became the director of Latter-day Saint Charities, the month after I was appointed, there was an audit. We have these regular audits, but I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. There was, a, there was an accountant named Lori Sims who was very experienced, and she sat in my office and explained to me in language that I could understand the very complicated financial instruments that were being used as part of this audit. Now, Lori passed away just last weekend. And I felt deep grief about that. She's the accountant that I work with at work. But I felt that way. Why? Because she took a personal interest in me. Not a business interest, but a personal interest in helping me be better at my job. This is President Bingham. And this is the Afghan mother and daughter that she befriended and was their English teacher like 23 years ago when they first came to the United States. They have no idea what it means to be the General Relief Society president. They call her all the time. We want to see you. We're going to bring you food. We want to. And she loves the relationship because of that. And she would, she would never be able to say, I, I'm traveling too much. I'm too busy. This is one of her primary relationships. And it, it produces change. It produces change in their lives and then the lives that they affect others. This is the one I want to show you about. This is going to be four minutes, and you're going to see what circle leaders and allies do together. And notice, when you watch this video, the agency and the voice. At the Adventist Community Center in Provo, People gather for a meal, but the occasion is not a church supper. Most of poverty are the people that you see that you would have no idea that they're struggling to find out which bill to pay. It's a weekly evening meeting of the Provo branch of Utah Circles. These are folks who work together to reach a goal, getting out of poverty. 
We've been married for about 11 and a half years and we've been below the poverty line for 10 of that. We've had um, moments where we were both unemployed. We got evicted from apartments because of that. In nine years, we moved 10 times, um, just between living with relatives and, and trying to find a place of our own. It was, it was rough, especially with little ones. It was just survival mode, day to day, and uh, we just didn't know how to get out of it. There's just no way you can get out of the rent cycle or um, just to keep moving. How do, you, how do you get that dream to take your family to Disneyland? Or how, do you, how are you going to ever get enough to retire? Nothing distracts from the object of every meeting making and following up on individual plans to get out of poverty. There are two groups of people here, circle leaders, those working to improve their financial situations, and community volunteers who've agreed to become the circle leaders' friends and allies. People who struggle in poverty tend to um, become more and more isolated and their social capital goes down, and it's a downward spiral. So the idea of circles is to reverse that. We tell our circle leaders or our clients, okay, you are directing your path. You get to move forward how you want and how you decide because you know yourself best. So their circle is their circle leader, their allies, me as the coach, and outside community resources. Those who've met the requirements to become a circle leader have a stable housing situation and no medical or mental health issues that would block their progress. They learn about goal setting, they work on defining the path out of poverty, and they are matched with the allies that will support them in their journey. I jump ahead and have a hard time breaking things down and explaining what it is I have going on in my mind. So he helped me, he helps me break that down so I can take those small steps rather than, okay, here's the big jump that I have to take. You're not their coach. You don't know more than they do in the sense of their situation and how to get out of it. You're, we're just teaming you up as friends and you would help them as you would help your friend. Circles can be an opportunity to join family to family in pursuit of a better life for both, as is the case with Anthony and Sherry working with Jim and Kim. It's been a huge booster having friends. We've had some down moments the last few months and having somebody that we can call or text or just to say, hey, I, I'm, I need somebody, and they're there. It's fun to be in our role because we advocate and suggest, but at the end of the day, we're, we're just there to say, you can do this, you know, with what's and your goal. And they really make their own goals. Yeah. So. It's fun. And they just come at you and say, well, uh, tell you what, let's let's hold on a bit longer and see what else comes down the road because uh, something something good will always come along. We just have to have the patience to uh, and the, the and the fortitude to recognize that. Everything we've done, we, we we're not allowed in the circles program to give money. We're not allowed. So all we're doing is giving encouragement, support, and connecting them with with people that we. They, that they don't know that they should know. We've hooked them up with uh, Rachel, who hooked them up with a friend, who got Anthony some help he needed at school. I've Think about agency and voice and how that's being used there, and the interdependence of those couples and how they work with each other and how they learn from each other, that exchange. I think that's a practical application of all of that data that we saw earlier tonight. So, anyway. My last thing, the last leadership characteristic that I want to talk about is not letting issues destroy common ground. We work and live in a place of polarity. Everything's being driven into black and white where there's actually a lot of gray. The example that I wanted to, to live, does anybody know who this is? <laughs> Pamela Atkinson. We love her and she is an advocate for the homeless, for suicide prevention, for, for many kinds of things. She's an elder in the First Presbyterian Church, but she has, she grew up in poverty herself. She told me she didn't know that not everybody put cardboard in their shoes, and she didn't know that people used sheets until she slept over at one of her friends from school and saw that all the beds had sheets on them. She'd never seen that before. So she grew up from, with a single mom in London in poverty. 
But at 14, she decided, I'm going to change my life. And education is the way that I can change my life. So she first she became qualified as a nurse. She moved to Australia. She came to the United States. She eventually found her way to Utah. Now, Governor Herbert calls her the Mother Teresa of Utah. She hates that. But <laughs> if you're filling out your taxes and you can put part of your refund in the Pamela Atkinson Homelessness Trust, you go down to the Fourth Street Clinic for the, for the health clinic there. It's called the Pamela Atkinson Clinic. People have done those things for her. She gave eight characteristics that, that make it work for her, and Forbes published this. So I just wanted to share them with you. The first one is ego has no role in service. It's not about you. It's about them. The second, it's about collaborating. You have to find ways to, to find common ground and then to build on that. It's about collaboration. You're going to give a little bit. They're going to give a little bit, but you're going to get farther than you were. The third one is don't be afraid to speak out. She talks about sometimes she's the only person in the room, and she just feels the awkward silence that, that um, Gloria Steinem talked about. But if you don't speak out, other people cannot bring their energy around that idea later on. You have to be the one to speak. And she's uh, a good example of that. She said, don't give up. If people turn her down, she is the most successful fundraiser the state has ever seen. And if you turn Pamela down, which I have had to do many times, she'll say, what could I do to change your mind? <laughs> and then you have that discussion. <laughs> Everyone can do something. She tells a story, she was actually teaching this, everyone can do something, and a woman said, there's nothing that I can do. I live on a limited income, I don't have a car, I'm 82 years old, and I live below the poverty line. There's nothing I can do. And <coughs> Pamela said, I challenge you to donate a can of soup once a week to the food bank. And she said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but over a year, that represented hundreds of meals, a can of soup to the food bank. So there's always something everyone can do. One of my least favorite aspects of, of modern charity work is that we think it's about money. It's not about the money. It's about the, the personal investment. It's about the relationship. It's about these leadership skills. The power of touch and a smile. If you go out with Pamela, which I do often, working with people that are they're living on the streets, and you'll find people that are sleeping behind a hedge, she'll always reach down and touch them on the shoulder to wake them up. Very gentle. When she hands out supplies or socks or something, she always squeezes their hand because she was serving food for the first time in the Salvation Army, some other place, and the general of the, of the Salvation Army, he said they haven't had touch in weeks. They, they hunger for that personal connection, and she's always remembered that, and she implements that. She always says, never let an issue interfere with the relationships. And that's true. We live in a slash and burn. If you aren't my way, it's over. The relationship is finished. And Pamela always says, we, we may not agree, but we'll always have a relationship, We're, because that's the most important thing. And avoid emotional bankruptcy. You have to take care of yourself. You can't be a strength in your community if you are running empty yourself. So make sure you take care of yourselves. I want to just bring this up. There are many, many ways that we can help, but one of the effective ways is the platform of Just Serve that connects people who want to do something with people who need something. So I put in 84606 because I couldn't remember the zip code for UVU. <laughs> but it says there's 103 opportunities within five miles of here. OK, what are they? OK, these are just the first ones that come up. There's 97 that don't show here. Become a circle's ally. Fight poverty by being one of those allies that we saw in the film. Donate dinner for people that are coming to the circles meeting. Drive people to their cancer appointments that are in recovery. Work with refugees preparing their resumes. Uh, help them in different ways to get integrated. Show them around the community. Be an after school reading and math tutor to elementary school kids. There's 97 more. But there, these are opportunities. These are ways that you can look to. And please post on Just Serve if you have opportunities as well. I'll conclude with this. Last week was the ninth anniversary of me being in Syria on this trip. I was there working with the University of Damascus on their dairy herd. So there I am on the phone ordering bull semen from Canada to be shipped to Syria with a US domestic uh, you know, a Department of Commerce license. What do I know about that? But I do now. <laughs> trying to improve their dairy herd. 
So I traveled, we're working with the agriculture doctors and uh, did quite a lot of work there. As part of that, I went up, drove the road up through Homs, through Hama, all the way up to Aleppo to talk about the maternal newborn training we were going to be doing with the medical school there in six months. Looked at the facilities, uh, negotiated with the president to, to use the dormitories, that kind of thing. And then church security called me and they said, you know, there's these demonstrations that are happening in Damascus, very peaceful, but why don't you get out of town? So <laughs> I took the Latter-day Saint Charities couple with me and we rode a bus, three, a city bus, three hours south to a place called Basra where there were some uh, Roman ruins. But every day the security situation got a little bit tighter and I left. And then uh, that was in February, so that was nine years ago, February. And that was the very beginning whispers of this horrific, unbelievably cataclysmic war. And it's just one war that's going on. There are many places. But for me, because I drove those roads, because I was with those people, it's personal to me. And I followed the, the, the terribleness of this war. 6.7 million Syrians are outside the country, and another 6 million are displaced inside. They are middle class. They are people just like us, sitting in universities, taking their tests. What has happened there became personal to me. And so this is an area just outside of Aleppo, outside of the university where I was. When I look at this level of destruction and I think, what can I do? As, as president of, a, of an organization that, that works on disaster relief, but I don't know what to do about that. It's so big. We have to understand there are things that we can do as global organizations, as grassroots organizations, as, as individuals, and we should do them. And there will always be things that we can't do. And we have to accept those things with grace, too. Now, I don't believe anything is impossible. That's my driveway. I come out to get in my car. How did that happen? <laughs> There's a scripture in Mark 10. The, uh, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, he, he, he's, he, he said, they said, they're talking about wealth and riches. And he said, it's harder for somebody with their money to get into the kingdom of God than it is for a, the camel to go through the eye of the needle. And they're shocked. If, the, if that's true, who can be saved? And then he says the thing that is so helpful to me. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So that, I don't know what to do about that. But I, with my faith, I have to trust that God sees those people, he hears their prayers, and he responds in ways that are godly and divine. And I'm committed that I will use my energy and my power to do everything that I can and then count on him. And this is my other favorite thing. For things that are dead, for things that are rotten, that you think there is no hope, there is always hope hope. So I challenge you, whatever you have felt, whatever you looked at and you have an idea in your mind, go do that thing. Do it individually, do it as a grassroots and join with global organizations, but be that kind of change and use these leadership principles and give evidence to the fact that men and women can work together and make the change that we see for our security, for our economics, and most of all for our families and our children. Thanks very much. Hasn't this been an amazing evening? Just to want a couple to say a couple things. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention a little bit about the leadership roles. What we struggle with here in Utah is we actually have many people in the community doing work, and we need many more. There's so many places and ways to serve, but in the statistics and the reports I do. One of the things that we really are short on here in the state of Utah is for women to donate their time and be engaged in actually leadership roles within our, like being on boards and commissions for cities and for counties and for the state, um, to actually you know, strengthen our confidence and, and really 
find ourselves uh, needing to strengthen and, and need to strengthen that leadership identity to believe within ourselves and to know, because sometimes socialization, they made it through without many tears, but I get teary-eyed pretty. Sometimes, and I ha just had two women uh, earlier this week say to me, I am not supposed to use my voice. I'm not supposed to lead. That's not my role. That's my husband's role. And I said to both of them different times, that's crap. That's what I say. <laughs> that's just crap. So anyway. And I've been known, I've been known to say that in Latter-day Saint chapels, actually. <laughs> I try not to, but um, but what I know for sure, and I am committed 100%, uh, actually more than 100%, is for me being a spiritual person, and I work with people that, that are not religious or spiritual as well, for me, I absolutely believe that God needs women just as much as men and loves women just as much as men and needs our voices in our communities, needs our strength, needs our voices, needs our energy, needs our minds, our you know, head, heart, and hands to actually move forward things in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our counties, in our cities, in our states, but around the world. I mean, Valerie, Valerie's data is just so powerful. And if we as fairly privileged people are so bogged down sometimes in what we're doing, and can't look up and look at other people's needs around us, let alone global. Who else is going to do this work? Who else? It really is us. And so I really um, take Valerie's challenge and Sharon's challenge and, and push that out to you one more time, that let's look at our gifts and strengths. And by the way, we're socialized sometimes as women when people say, oh, you're good at this, we, we push it away. But what the research says is when we know our gifts and strengths, we can actually serve the world and contribute in more meaningful ways. So think about our gifts and strengths and then how we can do things even more differently than we're doing now. How can we influence, how can we impact in stronger ways that can move things forward for girls and women and families in the state of Utah, in the nation, as well as globally. Thanks so much for coming today. I appreciate all that.